Hello, my name is Walter Swan. I'm a Regional Technical Manager with Tartar Steel and today I'm going to talk to you about vibrations. So the main body of the presentation is going to look at a hand calculation method that's uh, presented in the SCI uh, guide. Uh, but just before we delve into that uh, calculation method, I want to take a look back at past custom and practice and just uh, explore what we did um, and how that's changed with the new method uh, presented in the SCI document. Um, I'll then wrap up towards the end with just a mention of one or two special cases and then just uh, summarise uh, the proceedings. So, if we take a look back at how we used to design beams for vibration, we did something very, very simple. Uh, we designed them for a natural frequency of 4 Hz. Um, and that natural frequency was calculated from a, a simple formula and it was based on the self-weight of the slab and the beam, uh, the ceiling in the services and 10% imposed load. And that approach essentially meant that we got um, a lower probability of adverse comment from users of our buildings. Um, we got less likelihood of resonant excitation and effectively what we did was we kept ourselves out of trouble from a structural point of view. But what that didn't really do was give us a realistic indicator of the serviceability performance of that floor. So the SCI guide P354 tries to put that right. Um, it looks at floor vibrations from internal sources and its primary concern or the primary source of vibrations is footfall force. Although there is some guidance on staircases and what to do if you have things like uh, aerobics flows in the building. Uh, several methods are presented. Um, the first one is a finite element um, approach and it gives you some guidance on using uh, software methods to get an idea of the performance of the floor. And there's also the simplified design method, which is a hand calculation method, which we're going to major on in this presentation. It introduces us to the concept of accelerations being the measure of performance of our floor. So we're moving away from frequency and it's accelerations that we need to be uh, concerned about. And then once we've got those accelerations, we can then compare those with some acceptance criteria to give us an idea of whether our floor is good in terms of vibration or not so good. There's also some guidance in the document about retrofit and remedial strategies, uh, but essentially uh, the main part uh, or the main recommendation of the guide is that you really don't want to be going there. If you take a look inside the document, um, there's mathematical expressions as far as the eye can see. And the dilemma is often knowing which one you should actually use. Um, but there's a reason for uh, the complexity, and that is we've gone from simple statics to dynamics. And uh, by definition, that means that we're in a more complex uh, environment. But hopefully this presentation will clarify the process for you. So before we delve into the detail, I want to step back and take a look at the big picture. So we're going to check the frequency but we're going to check the frequency of what and why, because there's some changes here in terms of the way that we're going to do things going forward compared to the way that we've done things previously. And we're going to calculate the acceleration, and that's going to give us the, uh, the measure of performance of, uh, of the floor. So why do we check the frequency? Well, I'm hoping that this graph here will explain why. So along the horizontal axis, uh, we have... Um, a ratio, and it's the ratio of the force and frequency, the frequency that we walk at, which is typically around about 2 hertz, and the natural frequency of the system. And this is where one of the changes has taken place because we're being um, guided by the, uh, by the SI publication to use a fundamental frequency of 3 hertz as a minimum. The vertical axis gives us something called the dynamic magnification factor. And effectively what this is saying is that if we go above a certain level, then we need to factor up our static loads um, to allow for the dynamic effect of the vibrations. And then we've got a series of curves, and those series of curves um, basically allow for the damping that's in the system. Now, if we take our 2 hertz 
walk and pace frequency and divide it by the fundamental frequency of our flow and let's say that we've designed it to the 3 Hz minimum we end up with a value of 0 0.67 and if we go up to the air curve and then draw a line across to the vertical axis we end up with a dynamic magnification factor of 1 so the reason why we're now limiting our fundamental frequency to 3 Hz is to ensure that we don't have a dynamic magnification factor greater than 1. If we have a dynamic magnification factor greater than 1, then that means we now have dynamic effects going on which are going to impact on the ultimate limit state design of our structure. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a sidestep here. Um, and we're going to uh, just consider um, something called Dunkley's expression, which is shown by those equations there. And it's a method of coupling elemental frequencies together to get a measure of the system frequency. So top left, we have a two-component system. We have a precast unit, for instance, spanning approximately six meters onto a beam, and the beam spans onto the columns. Now you'll have to take my word for it, but the precast unit will have a frequency of about 5 Hz. Uh, if we design the beam to, uh, to 4 Hz and we couple those two frequencies together, we find that the system frequency, i.e. the combination of the beam and the slab, is just over 3 Hz. So we're, we're okay with that. If we now take a look bottom left, we have a more um, traditional uh, composite flooring system. So we've got our composite slab spanning onto a secondary beam, secondary beam spanning onto a primary beam, and the primary beam onto the columns. Now again, you'll have to take my word for it, but the composite slab will have a frequency probably of around about 20 hertz. If we assume that the primary beam and the secondary beam have been designed to 4 hertz, and we bundle those together using Dunkley's expression, we end up with a system frequency that's underneath that threshold value of 3 hertz. So with three component systems, we have to be a little bit careful, particularly if we're pushing it in terms of the design. Often what we find with our modern composite systems is that they're rectangular in profile. And so the primary beam will naturally have a higher frequency of maybe five or six hertz, which will drag that system frequency back up. So that's kind of dealing with frequency. Now let's turn our attention to accelerations. And again, if I can just remind you that the SCI guide is suggesting that accelerations are the thing that's going to give us a measure of the performance, a qualitative measure of the performance of the slab. And in the SCI guide in P354, we're presented with this equation here. Uh, it looks rather confusing. Uh, there's lots of variables in there which we've never ever come across before. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify that for you. And I'm going to tell you that that is nothing more than a variant of Newton's second law, but rearranged for acceleration. So what we're told is that the acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. And it's really, really useful if you can just keep that in mind as we go through the presentation, because it doesn't get any more complex than that. So if we now open the guide, um, there's quite a lot of theory in the front of the guide. And it's not until you get to around page 45 that it starts to take you through a design process. And that's where we're going to start the presentation with this simplified design approach. And the first step in that uh, simplified design approach is to determine the response factor R for the flow. So let's go and do that now. Now again, we have to break that down into a couple of steps. And the guidance is given in P354 to take us through the process. So first of all, we need to define the natural frequency of the flow. And we get some help in section 7.1 on that. We then need to check that against the minimum frequency value, which I've already hinted at in the presentation so far, which is now 3 Hz. So that's in section 7.2. And then we've got to determine something called the modal mass. Um, and we're given some guidance in section 7.3 on that. Once we've got the mass, we can use Newton's second law. We can determine the acceleration. And section 7.5 helps us in that direction. Once we've got the acceleration, we then need to turn that into a response factor, and that's just a mechanism that allows us to compare that with the acceptance criteria contained in the British Standard.
So let's take a look at frequency. Um, if we look in the SCI guide, it refers us to some studies that were done um, in walking pace frequency. So a lot of studies were done to look at what sort of range of frequencies we as human beings walk at. And I think the range was uh, described as somewhere between one and a half and two and a half hertz. The SCI guide has basically said that in terms of buildings, uh, that range is actually a little bit narrower. Uh, and it's somewhere between 1.8 and 2.2. So as an average, 2 hertz would be the typical sort of walking pace frequency for somebody walking down a corridor in an office block. The guide then says that we haven't just got to calculate the element frequencies. We've also got to calculate the system frequency and the flow frequency at 2. And irrespective of whether we're looking at uh, the beam, uh, the slab, um, or the system, the minimum frequency for any element or the collective is 3 hertz. So that's our new limit that we're working to. And in terms of calculating that frequency, uh, we're using that simple formula on the bottom of the slide there, which is 18 upon root of the deflection. If we're going to adopt um, a hand calculation method, uh, we want to make the process um, as easy and as simple as possible. Um, and generally speaking, what we find is that uh, in the case of composite flows, um, there are two possible mode shapes that you're most likely to get and which can confidently be used to assess the performance of a composite flow. One of those is the secondary beam mode and the second is the primary beam mode. So I'll just take you through each of those in turn. So starting with the secondary beam mode, um, if we look at the diagram there on the right hand side, we notice that our primary beams in effect are, are, are fixed. They're not taking part in the motion of the floor at all. Um, our secondary beams take on a sine wave form. So in terms of calculating the deflection of those, it's our simple deflection formula for a simply supported beam, which then allows us to calculate the frequency. Now for our slab, uh, that will have um, a fixed ended boundary condition, which may feel a little bit strange if we're used to designing the slab as simply supported for the ultimate limit state. Uh, but at this point, it's worth mentioning that when we're talking about air vibrations, we're talking about relatively small deflections, and essentially there's not enough um, force um, in the system to overcome the frictional forces. Um, so it's valid to um, use those boundary conditions. So this is our primary beam mode. And again, if you take a look at the diagram on the right hand side there, the subtle difference that you see here now is that the primary beams are now taking part in the, uh, in the deflected form of, uh, of the floor plate. So our secondary beams are um, basically simply supported members. So we use our simply supported deflection formulae. Um, our secondary beams are now acting as fixed-ended beams in this mode shape. So again, we're using standard deflection formulae, and our slab will behave as a fixed-ended member as well. P354 presents us with this table, um, and it's really a shortcut to, uh, to calculating the deflections. And superficially, it perhaps looks quite complicated, and you might ask yourself, where do those formulae come from? And it's nothing more... Um, complex than the standard deflection formulae that you'd find in the back of the steel designer's manual. So all you're doing is taking your primary beam deflection, using the standard formulae to calculate that, adding that to your secondary beam deflection, and adding that to your slab deflection. Um, and that gives you the deflection, if you like, of the system. But all it's doing is using the standard deflection formulae that you know and love, and just algebraically simplifying those. If we just run through one or two of the terms, um, so we've got um, M, which is our dead load, plus 10% uh, uh, imposed load. We've got G, which is the acceleration due to gravity, which you know. And we've got E, which is our elastic modulus of, uh, of the steel. Um, our IB and our IP are the stiffnesses of um, the beams, but... Uh, they're the stiffness taking into account the concrete slab as well. So the composite inertias that we're calculating. So we've got to do some calculations from, uh, from first principles there. 
In terms of the slab, uh, we can, if we wish, calculate the inertia, the composite inertia of the slab from first principles, or we can use this table from P354. So here we're presented with some um, simplistic formulae, which will give you um, a quick assessment of what the inertia of the slab is, depending on whether it's normal weight concrete or lightweight concrete, and depending on what the, uh, the profile type that's used is. But a lot easier than doing it from first principles. So once we've calculated the deflections of our elements, um, we have some options in terms of calculating the system frequency. The first one is that we can simply add all the deflections of the elements together to calculate the total deflection of the system and again use that simple formula of 18 upon root of the deflection to calculate the frequency. Our other option is that we can use Dunkley's expression, which you've seen previously in the presentation, to add together the individual element frequencies to get an indication of the frequency of the system as a whole. Both of those routes will give you exactly the same answer. The one on the bottom equation 5 might be useful if, for instance, you've used some proprietary software which is outputting frequencies but doesn't give you um, the deflections. So we've now calculated the natural frequency not only of our elements but also of the flow system and we now need to check that against some threshold values. You've seen this slide before but the threshold value that we're comparing it with is 3 Hertz. So the frequency that we've calculated of the, of the elements must be greater than 3 Hertz and the frequency of the system as a whole must be greater than 3 Hertz. So we're now moving on now. So we've done the frequency check. We're now moving on to do the performance check, if you like. And the first step in that process is that we need to calculate something called the modal mass. Uh, now, the modal mass is essentially a product of the weight per square meter or the mass per square meter of the slab um, and the beams themselves. But then we're allowed to spread that over a certain area. And that area is influenced by the construction that we're dealing with. So in P354, um, there are three sets of expressions that we can use. There's a set of expressions for a downstand composite arrangement. Um, and there's a set of expressions for a slim deck or a slim floor arrangement. And there's a set of expressions for a light gauge steel type floor. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is concentrate on the expressions that are given for a downstand composite arrangement. And this is them, it's equations 45 and 46. Um, so if we concentrate on LEF, so what is LEF? Um, essentially it's the effective length of the floor that will take part in the motion as that floor is trafficked by a human being. Um, and it's a function of the stiffness of the, uh, of the beam um, the system frequency, the mass, and the Young's modulus of the, uh, of the system. Um, but there is a maximum uh, limit that, uh, that we have uh, placed on us with that, um, and it's NY, LY. So LY is simply the beam span, and NY, we're told, can be a maximum of four. Um, now, you may start to think, well, if we've got a problem, with one of our floors and we're trying to increase the area um, that uh, we can use in our expressions, can we, can we do anything with this? What would happen, say, if we increased the inertia of, uh, of the secondary beam, the IB value? And you can see that it probably starts to get quite complex because if you increase IB, you also increase F0 and the two tend to play against one another. So in very simple terms, what I'm going to suggest to you is that if you do find that you have an issue with a floor, that it's a bit lively, there's probably not much mileage in trying to play around with the stiffness of the floor. Uh, what the publication is probably trying to tell you is that you need to increase the mass in the system to control those, uh, those deflections. If we take a look at the bottom expression now, we've got S. Uh, what, what is S? It's the effective width. 
So effectively, it's a multiple of our grid spacings. And again, we've got a maximum number that we can take, which is four times uh, that. Um, there's a funny um, expression. Um, I'm going to call it squiggly N uh, down in that expression for S. And you see from the table that uh, that um, variable takes on a value depending on what the system frequency is. And what I'm going to suggest is that for most of the flows that you design, you'll find that the system frequency lies somewhere between 3 and 4 hertz. So most of the time that variable will take on a value of 0 0.5. So we now know where we stand with, uh, with the modal mass, and now we're going to move on to the acceleration. So you've seen this expression, I showed this at the beginning of the presentation. We've got an expression for accelerations, and that is the expression that we're going to work with. But just to make a quick point, in the publication, we're presented with two expressions for the acceleration. One is a prediction of the acceleration for a low frequency flow, and a low frequency flow is one with a frequency between 3 Hz and 10 Hz, and the second expression is for a high frequency flow. The high frequency flow expression I'm going to suggest that we put to one side, and we're just going to focus on this expression here, which is for a low frequency flow, which will cover most of the flows that I would anticipate you would uh, design as, a, as an engineer. The thing to understand about our low frequency flows is that it takes a while for them to reach uh, their peak acceleration. And the, uh, the graphs on the, uh, the bottom of the, the slide there try to illustrate that. So what you see is uh, somebody's heel making contact with the floor, and it probably takes four or five or six contacts before the, uh, the floor gets up to, uh, to peak acceleration. And the reason I mention that is that we're going to come back to that a little bit later on because that can help us if we want to fine tune our calculations. So here's our expression for the acceleration. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go through each of the terms. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quick route through and I'm going to gloss over some of the terms and then I'll come back to them later. So we're looking for a quick crude assessment to give us a feel for whether the flow that we're looking at has a, has a problem with vibration or not. So, we've got these two factors, mu e and mu r, and you might have read the slide, but what I'm going to suggest at the moment is that we just let them take a value of 1, and that is conservative, and we'll move on. We've got um, an expression here, or a variable here, that takes into account um, the damping in the flow system. And the guide gives us some uh, help in terms of uh, what damping value we should take relative to how um, that flow is loaded in terms of chairs, tables, and so on and so forth. So we've got a value that we can pluck from a table and input into that expression. We've then uh, got something called the resonance build-up factor. And again, we've got um, a simple graph in the guide. And what it's asking us to look at is what the walking pace length is. So for this, we're needing to know, know a little bit of information about the building. Um, so how big is the floor plate? Is it open plan? Is there a corridor? And that would uh, influence um, the dimension that we take for that walking path length. Once we've got the walking path length, we uh, cast a line up to uh, one of the curves and then across to the left hand side to read off the vertical axis. But again, we could conservatively take a value of one if we wanted to get to an answer quickly. Then we've got something called the co-defined weighting factor for human perception. And again, I'm not gonna delve into this too much at this stage. All I'm gonna tell you is that there's a single chart provided and all you need to know to access that chart is the system frequency of your flow. So if you had a system frequency of 3 Hz and you read 3 Hz along the bottom axis there, the horizontal axis, cast up to the curve and then across to the vertical axis, you'd find that you had a factor of 0 0.9. So there we are. That's the, um, the acceleration expression dealt with in a, in a superficial way, but I'm going to come back to one or two of those variables later. Right, so we've calculated our acceleration now. And now we need to turn that acceleration into a response factor. And that's so that we can compare it with the threshold values given in the British standard. 
So how do we do that? Uh, well, it's very simple. We take our acceleration and we divide it by a constant. And the constant that we're going to use takes on a value of 0 0.005. So we're back to our flow chart again. So we've calculated our response factor now. That was the first step in our process. We've now got to check that against the acceptance criteria. So where do we go for the acceptance criteria? Well, BS6472 is the place, but the SCI have very kindly um, repeated that in the, uh, in the publication, P354. Um, and um, here we have a chart which describes uh, various uh, different uses of our building. And then we're given some response factor values. So if we take our hospital, we're told that we have to have a response factor of one during the day and a response factor of one during the night. And that's based on continuous vibration. So in terms of footfall force, that means you've got to have a corridor which is continually being trafficked every minute of every day. And a day in this case is for a 16 hour period and every minute of every night. And in BS6472 terms, that's an eight hour period. And again, I emphasize that because I'm going to come back to that later. But we're also given response factors for other uses of buildings as well. And if I pick on offices, so there we're told that we should have a response factor of four during the day and a response factor of four during the night. Um, the SCI guide also supplements the information given in BS6472. So in the case of offices, it actually gives us a slightly different value. Um, and it recommends a value of eight for a general office and then for a dealing floor, a value of four. Now that was based on some information that was given in the predecessor to, uh, to this publication, um, which gave slightly higher values. I think it gave a response factor of 12 for a busy office. And I guess if we could try and describe a busy office for you, it might be something like a call center uh, where you've got telephones ringing, you've got VDU monitors on, and you've got people walking past one another. So there's lots of visual, lots of audible distractions. And in that sort of scenario, we're less sensitive to picking up vibrations in a floor. The converse to that would possibly be, say, a consulting engineer's office, uh, where you've got uh, people who are concentrating intently on the task in hand, so they're designing their buildings or they're doing their AutoCAD drawings and there's not much in the way of visual and audible distractions. In that sort of scenario, you become more sensitive to air to vibrations. Now, the guidance given in the SCI publication, they've had no adverse feedback from building users to suggest that the guidance given is, uh, is flawed in any way. So we would recommend the use of the SCI guidance. We have a design guide uh, which is based on theory um, and it's always useful to have theory which is backed up by testing. Um, and this slide here uh, shows some testing that was done on several hospitals a number of years ago now. Um, and effectively um, a professor from a university went in with his uh, special bits of machinery and measured the response factors in these buildings. And you'll see that they're, they're all steel frame buildings um, and they range in terms of spans. So at the top of the table there, Hospital 1, we have a 13.2 by 7.2 grid. For Hospital 2, we have a 15 by 7.5 grid. So we've got a long span solution there. And then for the bottom two buildings, St. Richard's Hospital and Sunderland Royal Infirmary, we have some uh, short span shallow solutions, slim deck solutions as it happens. So we've covered the range of possible steel solutions. And if we look down the right hand column of that table, you'll see that the response factor in no case exceeded the design value of one, which is required for a hospital. So with a degree of confidence, we can say that uh, steel buildings can uh, be designed for vibration as long as you start out off with the correct um, acceptance criteria from day one. So let us now uh, consider what happens if we do some calculations, we calculate the acceleration, 
uh, we then calculate the response factor and we find that that doesn't quite meet the requirements of the acceptance criteria given in the British standard. So what options do we have available to us? The first thing that we could look at, look at is something called variable dose values. Um, but just before I tell you what they are, we need to understand that they might not be allowed in the specification. So it's really important to check the specification to make sure that they're allowed in your design. The classic case when they're not allowed is operating theatres and hospitals. So what is a variable dose value? Well, before when I told you about the acceptance criteria, um, I showed a table um, and in that table it said that the acceptance criteria quoted were based on an 18 hour day in terms of daytime exposure and continuous exposure to that vibration. Well, if you look around modern office blocks, you'll find that they're not constantly trafficked by, uh, by people. So that exposure time becomes reduced in real terms. And if the exposure time is reduced, that means that you can accept or tolerate a higher acceleration. And that's what variable dose values try to, uh, try to address. And again, perhaps the best way to illustrate how this works is to delve into the, um, into the guide. And we're presented with, uh, with this table here. Um, and what I'm going to do is assume that we've designed a floor and it's been designed to a response factor of 8 hertz, but we've done the calculations and we found out that the response factor is actually 9. It's a little bit higher than we need it to be. Now, we've looked at the drawings and we've decided that the, uh, the corridor length or the walking path length is 10 metres. So we draw a line across the graph to the um, 10 metre curve and then down to the horizontal axis and what we've got now is an indication of how many crossings we could tolerate um, in that in that corridor so now what we need to do is take a look at the building look at how many people we might have in a particular office and kind of make an educated guess about what would be a reasonable number of crossings up and down that corridor in that uh, in that period and if we're under that value then fine if we're over that value it means that we have to adopt a different strategy so what happens if our response factor um, is greater than the multiplying factors and variable dose values are allowed well we go through that process that I've just described we determine the actual flow traffic um, and if the allowable is greater than the actual, then that's it, that's job done. But what happens if the allowable um, is less than, uh, than the actual? Well, one thing that we can look at is the walking paths. Do we have a particularly long walking path, which is say 20 meters? And could we do something simple like say, introduce doors into that corridor? If we introduce doors into the corridor, that will break up um, the vibrations due to walking because it will break up the stride of the person walking down the corridor. So you won't reach those peak accelerations that I talked about in the charts earlier on. So that's one option available to us. Another option is to look at FE analysis. If we use FE analysis, we're going to get a bit more of an accurate result. And another option to us is to look at the mu e and the mu r factors, those factors that I glossed over a little bit earlier in the presentation. So what are those mu e and mu r factors? Um, well, effectively what they're taking account of is where the person is that is causing the source of excitation in the floor plate. And if he's at the peak position, then that's going to result in peak accelerations. But often what you find in real buildings is that the source of excitation will be a corridor and a corridor is often placed next to a column line. So if we take the source of excitation off that peak, we can use this expression down in the bottom right hand side here to calculate what the reduction factor would be that we can apply to the acceleration that we've calculated. The other mu factor takes into account the position of the receptor, if you like, who is receiving the vibrations. Again, if they're at peak position, 
then that mu factor would take on a value of 1. But if they're off the peak position, perhaps they're sitting by the window, then again we can use that expression to calculate a value which is going to be less than 1, which in turn will reduce the acceleration, which will turn will reduce the response factor. To do that though, we need information about the building, which may not be available at the design stage. So I talked previously in the presentation um, about this frequency weighting factor. Um, and at, the, at the time I glossed over it. Well now we're going to look into it in a little bit more uh, detail. In the BS and also in the guide, um, it tells us that if we consider the orientation of the people using the building, that we can fine tune our calculation process. So, what does that mean? It means that if we're standing up, we're on our z-axis, and it means that because we've got a little bit of flex in our knees, that uh, we won't feel the vibrations um, in the floor plate as much as we would if we were sitting down. And likewise, if we're lying down, that is the most sensitive position that we can be in. So if we're lying down, we're very, very sensitive to vibrations. If we're standing up, less so. So we need to know the axis of, uh, of uh, a vibration, or the, the axis that we're receiving those vibrations. Once we know the axis, we can then look at this table here, table 5.1. So we've got the description of the uses of the building, which uh, you might... Uh, find are familiar from a previous slide and then um, we've got the axis of vibration and then depending on what the axis of vibration is it refers us to a weighting curve and again the weighting curves are in the BS but they're also in the guide as well and here are our three weighting curves and you'll see that the curves are slightly different but again we simply have the system frequency on the bottom axis and then the weighting factor on the vertical axis and it's just a simple uh, case of um, casting a line up from the frequency axis and then across to the weighting factor to get a factor which is going to be less than one. So that fine tunes that calculation process for us. Now again I was uh, in the interest of simplifying things I told you that once we had the acceleration that we divided by a value of 0 0.005 to give us a response factor. That was true for z-axis vibrations but if we're about our x or, or our y axis, then that value now becomes 0 0.0035. So that was our plan B. That was kind of fine tuning that calculation process. But you can see that by looking at those, we generally have to have a bit more information about the use of the building. Um, and that sometimes isn't available to us at design stage. So I'm very quickly going to um, go through some special cases covered in the SCI guide, but in a, in a superficial um, sort of way. So flow subject to rhythmic activities, there's some guidance given. Um, and in days gone by, what we tended to do if we had a flow which was say an aerobic studio, is that we design the flow to a higher frequency, seven and a half hertz springs to mind. And the reason for that is that we were concerned about the dynamic effects, the fact that we'd get um, greater loads on the flow system than perhaps we were designing for due to, uh, due to vibration effects. The guide says that we can design at that 7.5 Hz frequency if we wish, but it, it presents us with an alternative option. And that alternative option is that we do our normal static load design and we calculate the system frequency and then we look at the ratio of the force and frequency relative to the system frequency to determine a dynamic magnification factor. In other words, a factor that we're going to apply our, to our loads and then redesign that floor for. So we've got a, an option there which might give us um, some economies compared to um, the old way of doing things. The guide also refers to hospital floors in section 8.2 and effectively just refers the reader to the health technical memorandum, um, which deals with um, the performance criteria required uh, for hospitals. There's some guidance too on light steel floors, and um, there is some guidance too on car parks. And if I can, I'd like to talk a little bit more about car parks. So there was some historic guidance, I think it came from the ISTRUCT-D, which instructed us that when it came to car parks, we should design to five hertz. 
Um, in our opinion, that was rather onerous and unnecessary for the type of building that we have. And um, there's no reason why the 3 hertz limit that we use for other buildings shouldn't apply to car parks. But the other thing uh, that was done was a, a desktop survey. Um, so we looked at uh, car parks that had been built um, and we made an assessment of the sort of response factors that those flows would have in those car parks. Um, and we found from that that a response factor of 65 would be appropriate for a car park. And you might ask the question, well, why so high? And the reason is this. If you're in a car park, you're normally doing one of two things. Um, you're either sat in your car, in which case you're isolated from the source of vibrations anyway, so you won't feel them. Or you're in transit, usually walking to your car or away from your car. And if you're walking to or away from your car, you're about your z-axis um, and you're less sensitive to vibrations. So that is the reason for the uh, relaxation of, um, of some previous guidance. So this is our, our final slide in, uh, in the presentation. Um, and what it is, is a method to get you to a place as quickly as possible. So you've got two expressions that you've seen in this presentation. One describes the acceleration, the other allows you to convert that acceleration into a response factor. Now there's a lot of things in that uh, expression for acceleration where you need a lot of information about the building. So what I'm going to say is let just, let's just conservatively take those values as one. So the mu e, the mu r, the rho and the w, let's make them one. We've now got three variables that we need to have a value for in that equation. One of them is q, and q is simply the average weight of a human being, which we're told is 746 newtons. So that's that one uh, knocked down. The other one is the critical damping ratio, and we've got a table out of the SCI guide, which informs us on that one. And then the next one is that we need to know the modal mass. Um, now, the modal mass is simply the product of the weight per square metre of the composite deck, multiplied by the effective width, multiplied by the effective length. And there's two approaches that we can have here. The first one is an optimistic one, and that is we take the biggest area allowed possible. So in other words, NY and NX would take on a value of 4, and our LY would be the span of the beam, and our LX would be the grid spacing. That would give us quite a large area. The other approach is to be a little bit more pessimistic and essentially take NY and NX as a value of 1 and then take LY as the span of the beam and LX as the grid spacing. And that allows us to calculate um, the acceleration and therefore the response factor in a two-line calculation. So very quickly what you can do is identify whether you're in the right ballpark. If you're in the right ballpark, you can then start to be more sophisticated with your calculations. If you're way out of the ballpark, then effectively it's kind of telling you that you need to increase the mass of your slab. That brings us to the close of the presentation on vibrations. Thank you for listening.